Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never practice nunchucks in a crowded room. Never eat chole before a road trip. Always take your shirt off before you are in it. Don't take a call near a swimming pool. And don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. We are heading for the general elections of 2024. And before we get into the real campaign situation, before action begins, we will also dedicate some episodes of Kartak to, to, to look at some of the key questions, key enduring questions in Indian politics. So today, for example, what is the Muslim vote? Is there such a thing as Muslim vote? Is there such a thing as a Muslim vote bank? Does somebody have ownership of this vote bank? Somebody has the keys to it? Or does somebody not have access to this vote bank? Meaning thereby are forces arrayed against the BJP? Do they own this vote bank? And does BJP have no access to it? Or, or there, is some, there is some nuance there. Again, is the BJP happy to be in this situation that they will, they will play in a field of 85% votes in India and leave out the 15% of Muslim voters? Or are they doing something about it? Now, I will talk about a bit of it myself. But also, I have with me a colleague of mine, Sanya Dhingra, who you know well. Uh, she's worked with us in two spells. One, as a reporter the first time, then she went to university overseas, to Columbia U University to study political science. She's come back and now she's looking at deeper issues, particularly to do with both RSS, BJP politics in terms of going back to their ideological texts. And we will talk about some of that on some other occasion with her, but also about how the minority, the Muslim minority is thinking. And she's done two very important stories, two very important, very detailed and very extensive stories, the kind of stories you do not read in Indian journalism these days. One is about the rise and not quite fa fall, but generally the waxing and waning and waxing and waning of the power of the ulema, of the clergy when it comes to Muslim politics. And second also about the Shia vote or about the Shia mind in India. Remember, 15% of India is Muslim and among the Muslims, 15% are Shia. So this is 15% of 15%. There's also been an impression that the Shias of India or Shias anywhere do not vote the same way as the, as the Sunni majorities do. Because barring a few countries, Shias tend to be a minority among the among the Muslims. So those two really nuanced, complex stories Sanya has handled. We'll share the links with you with the description. So please read those. Read those carefully because there's a lot of wisdom in those. And she will, I will lean on her to talk about many of these issues and really bail me out of this because this is a complex issue. Remember, for a long time, Indian Muslims, and this is something that I've written about in National Interest, more than once. The, the very fascinating thing about Muslim politics in India is that since India became independent, Indian Muslims have never trusted a Muslim as their leader. They've always chosen a Hindu as their leader or Hindus as their or some Hindus as their leader. So for a long time it might have been Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Indira Gandhi, the Congress Party in general, the Gandhi family, the Congress Party, then Mulayam Singh Yadav, Akhilesh Yadav, Lalu Prasad Yadav in, in Bihar. Similarly, the left in West Bengal, the Congress Party in Kerala, so on and so forth. Only lately in some parts of India, a couple of Muslim leaders have risen. And one would have thought, and there was some impression that at least one of them will grow a national footprint or will be accepted as a leader by Muslims across the country. And that was Asaduddin Ovesi who came from Hyderabad, Hyderabad city. That's his gut. That's his pocket borough. And he won the odd seat in Maharashtra. And people said, oh, now Indian Muslims have the rise of a Muslim leader. But that did not grow from there. He won a few seats in Bihar in the assembly election. Most of those fellows defected 
left his party and went back to the preeminent Muslim patronizing or pa preeminent party patronized by the Muslims there. So these are these are the complexities we are looking at in this situation. The BJP first, and I turn to Sanya now. Sanya, is the BJP even bothered? What sense are you getting? You've traveled, you've met a lot of people, a lot of people in the Muslim community, but you also track BJP, RSS, uh, and you read what they are publishing. Is the BJP completely resigned to not batting in that 15% or they want to do that? They certainly, most certainly want to do that. Um, and there are broadly, I think, three reasons that they're doing it. One is, of course, electorally, they would want to expand uh, their sort of vote share. That's why we're seeing a shift from their sort of minority politics from Shias to Pasmandas, because Shias, as you mentioned, are just 15% of the 15% Muslim population, whereas Pasmandas are 85% of the Muslim population. So from Shias, they're now they're increasingly talking about Pasmandas. So there is, of course, an electoral angle. Uh, they also internationally uh, on the front of sort of uh, foreign affairs they do not they want to show that muslims in india are doing well they don't want to put up that sort of an ugly face and thirdly there's an ideological reason as well which sort of for which we need to turn to the rss um ideologically they believe that pasmandas for example are all people lower caste muslims who were erstwhile lower caste Hindus who converted to Islam because of untouchability, because of the violence that they uh, sort of faced within Hinduism and that's why they turned to Islam. So they, in that sense, want to bring them back, at least culturally assimilate uh, this section of the Muslim population. I think from the Prime Minister himself, the messages are very clear about the minority outreach. So uh, at which point I shall tell you something, Ram Vilas Paswan, uh, he changed parties all the time. He was called by the cock and all that, quite rightly so. In 1997, when, 1996 in fact, in the debate on the 13-day Vajpayee government, when he defended the secular idea, he made a very good point. I consider that to be among the most important speeches made in Indian parliament. In fact, on which note, I must also tell you that we are now running a series called Hashtag Great Speeches. So Go to hashtag great speeches and you will find the many we have we have already published and we'll continue publishing these because these were speeches that defined modern India. So this I consider this as among one of those speeches and he said he raised a very important point there about making the case for Indian secularism and why there were so many Muslims in India. He said the truth is that with Babar only 40 Muslims came. Maybe it was more than 40, but he put it like that. He said, Babar ke saath to sirf 40 musliman aay the. Then how did so many, from where did all these crores of Muslims come? And he said, Aapne hume mandir nahi jane diya. To unhone masjid mein bulaya. Masjid chale gaye. You were not letting us come to your temples. We needed to find God someplace. They said, come to our mosques. So we went to their mosques. So that's the point that Sanya has made right now. That Pasmanda Muslims or who? But the majority of Muslims were called Pasmanda. The RSS believes that they were Hindus and they only became, they only embraced Islam because of untouchability in Hinduism and because of discrimination. Which is why if you go back to Mohan Bhagwat's statement, he said that at, at I think a couple of years ago, he said Hindus and Muslims have the same DNA. So this right. is what he was referring to. Right. We keep hearing about Ashraf Muslims, or Pasmanda Muslims. Sanya, you can tell us what is the breakup? And I believe, as I read from your story, there are actually three categories, not yeah. two. So, broadly, Ashrafs are the uh, dominant upper caste Muslims and they constitute just about 15% of uh, the sort of Muslim population. And all others are Ajlafs and Arz Arzals. Now, Ajlafs would be um, an equivalent of the backwards and Arzals would be the Dalits. Pasmandas is a category uh, which refers to both Ajlafs and Arzals. So, anybody who's not like a Brahmin-like figure, an Ashraf, is Pasmanda by... And the Muslim elites so far in India have mostly been most, from the Ashraf community. Including in the ulema, including if you go to AMU, most of the faculty, everybody is, it's full Brahminwad within uh, Muslims as well. Yeah, if, if you can put it like that. Hmm. So, uh, 
BJP is reaching out to the Pasmanda community and Shia community. Yes. Shia community, of course, the BJP has traditionally uh, go back even three decades, four decades. Shias have, uh, as you know, uh, for the piece when I was talking to Hilal Ahmed, he says Shias were the... Hilal uh, Ahmed is a scholar who also often writes for the print. Uh, and who has worked a lot on sort of Muslim politics. And he says Shias were the original sort of good Muslims for the BJP. Good Muslims. Uh, yeah. And now it is the Pasmandas. So Shias, of course, they have shared a relationship, a uh, good sort of, the, at least the Shia religious leadership has had good ties with BJP leaders for several decades. And this includes the likes of Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Lalji Tan, and basically mostly in Lucknow. Uh, this politics, uh, because Shias, mo remember, are mostly in Lucknow. That is considered the nerve center of Shia politics in India. Because the, 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 the home of Shia political and religious power in a way is Lucknow. Lucknow mm -hmm. also has the big Imam Bada. Yeah. And the rulers of Lucknow until 1857, that is Nawab Wajid Ali Shah, until his times, that ruling dynasty in Lucknow was a Shia dynasty. Yes. It was a Shia dynasty which took the Sunnis forward with them, but the Shia minority Shia dynasty ruled Lucknow for more than a hundred years, or ruled Awadh for more than a hundred years. So that is that is the power of the Shia in Lucknow. Yeah. And you talk a little bit more, explain this, yeah. how this works, and I will tell, tell you all a story. So yes, uh, Lucknow had Awadh had Shia rulers for, as you mentioned, more than a century. Uh, that time, Shias and Sunnis, although Shia rulers were a minority ruling over a majority Sunni community, they had deep fraternal ties. Uh, but, um, and as, as I think Wajid Ali Shah used to say, one of my two eyes is one is Shia and the other is Sunni. So there was sort of, there were sort of close relations. This begins to change with the advent of the uh, sort of uh, British rule, especially after 1857, uh, when the Shia Nawabs are ousted out of Awadh. And that kind of changes the political dynamic of the, 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 the place. And uh, especially because Sunnis now become a little more well-to-do than they earlier were. Shias, uh, their income stagnate or in fact decline. And at the same time, you see the growth of uh, Islamic revivalist sects like the Deobandis and the Barelis. Barelis yes. And they sort of begin to theologically codify Islam and also start sort of attacking a lot of Shia rituals. So and this, Shia theology as well. Shia theology as well. And um, that, that is the time we see the tension sort of become very grave between Shias and Sunnis. And then, of course, in the 20th century, uh, a, Throughout Lucknow is actually one of the cities in India which has the um, the strange repetition of having a history of communal rights which are not between Hindus and Muslims but between Sunnis and Shias. Twentieth century Lucknow had a series of deadly riots. And Gopal also had some of that. Hmm. And the, the story about that is from from the film Ishkia. That's <laughs> where Arshad Varsi, the two crooks, two hoods, you remember Arshad Varsi and his mamu Nasiruddin Shah. They go to Gorakhpur and then they find the, the gangs there. And he says, Mamu yaan se bhaag chalo, kyunki mare Bhopal mein to sirf do sena hoti thi, Shia aur Sunni ki. Yaan to Brahmin ki, Thakur ki, <laughs> Yadav ki, sab ki apni sena hai. So, so, India had a history of Shia Sunni riots. I also remember from my childhood in old Delhi, that Muharram time when the processions came out, right, police would be out and the general talk would be, now there might be Shia Sunni riots. Fortunately, in most of India, those things do not happen anymore for several decades now. So yes, hmm. for about a hundred years, that was the trend. Yeah. And um, in fact, in 1930s, when there was civil, a civil disobedience movement that Mahatma Gandhi was leading, there was a small civil disobedience movement that was breeding in Lucknow itself. And that was over... Uh, Sunni is leading a campaign to recite something called the Madhe Sahiba, which is a recitation that Sahiba is usually uh, is is a way to address an honorific honorific for the Holy Prophet. Yeah, so this recitation though commemorates all four Khalifas of Islam, which include Abu Bakr, Omar, uh, Usman, and Ali, as opposed to Shias who only believe that Ali was the only real successor of the Prophet. So they started running this campaign that after all Friday prayer prayers, we will collect and recite uh, Madhe Sahiba, and this sort of enraged the Shias and. Um, 
there were riots in Lucknow. Uh, the government thought that we should ban the Madhe Sahiba, uh, which in turn enraged the Sunnis. And and remember, this is a time when Sunnis are becoming more organized theologically. And also, uh, the Congress is increasingly realizing that they are more uh, dominant numerically. So, uh, the Sunni leadership uh, mm-hmm. decides to uh, advocate civil disobedience. So, the Congress crumbles under pressure. And this is the time when we see that sh- the Shia, uh, Shias and the Shia leadership in particular finds itself absolutely friendless. And the erstwhile rulers, ironically, are have nowhere to go to. They start, in fact, demanding separate electorates from the Sunnis. So the sort of and and that is something that Sadar Patel actually supported. <laughs> Maybe it was tactical, but he supported that because Sardar Patel uh, leaned towards the Shia. Yeah, and, and he also might have suggest agreed with the idea of separate electorates for the Shia. So he was humoring their demand and uh, this is not me saying it, Mushirul Hassan has uh, sort book, of yeah. in uh, an essay Professor that Professor Mushirul Hassan, former Vice Chancellor, late Mushirul Hassan, Vice Chancellor of Jamia Milia and also a very well acknowledged scholar and professor. So yeah, he writes that Patel uh, was humoring the Shia demands, even though he knew he cannot actually uh, enter, fulfill, them. Uh, fulfill them in any real way, neither him nor his party. But there you, but Patel was aware, according to um, Hassan, that uh, if he listens to the Shias, this will sort of puncture the Muslim League's uh, narrative of you know Muslims being one unified. Because con- community. Congress at this point was up against Muslim League and its two-nation theory. Exactly. So Congress. One thought that they will make alliances among the Muslims and the route to that was the ulema, the the deobandis and others. Because remember the other sort of uh, elite Muslims, especially the AMU Muslims, the Aligarh Muslim University uh, Muslims, were by and large... Uh, had aligned themselves with the Muslim League and were in favour of the two-nation theory. So the Congress needed other sort of elite Muslims. And, and, and that's why the Mulanas and Mulana Azad, for example, represented yes. that stream. So Mulanas, Ulema came with the Congress. And we'll, we'll come back to the Ulema issue. I will only tell you something about the Shia power. So after the destruction of Babri Masjid in 1992, when mood was really bad in India and Muslims were really angry and aggrieved as they should have been, Narsim Rao, among the things he did to calm them or, or calm the mood, he he invited Rafsanjani to come to India, Iran's leader, and persuaded him to go to Lucknow and address a congregation of the Shia at Lucknow's Imam Bada. Mm-hmm. And you know how big the Imam Bada is. It was a full congregation and that's where Rafsanjani said that India's Muslims should feel safe under the Indian system of secularism. Now, that was an appeal to Indian Shia. So, this game of dividing the Shia and Sunni and addressing each one as a different constituency has been played by both the BJP Hmm. and the Congress party. Hmm. 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 And the Congress, obviously, Sunni is being numerically more dominant. Uh, Their natural allies were uh, sort of the Sunnis and which is what the BJP is now seeking to do as well because they are also trying to... Enlarge so, what is the BJP doing with the Sunnis right now? I mean, there there's so many things, but Pasmanda outreach is one of them. Uh, if you see, uh, the Sufi outreach is also part of the Sunni outreach. We know that uh, the Prime Minister has talked a lot about uh, sort of organizing Sufi sammelans, wherein leaders of dargahs, various dargahs across the country, uh, they're meeting uh, with BJP leaders, uh, delegations are uh, meeting, they're doing Sufi nights, and uh, there are a lot of stories uh, about this. And recently, in fact, uh, the Prime Minister presented a chadar into the to a delegation uh, uh, in the Ajmer Dargah. Ajmer Dargah. So, so and uh, Sun and uh, Sufis are basically they belong to the Barelvi sect of Sunnis, and the difference being that the Deobandi sect believes ki on, we can only pray to Allah, while the Barelvis and the Sufis believe that we can also pray to. Uh, so there can be intermediaries between the Allah. The peers like. Hazrat Nuzambuddin, exactly. Hazrat so, yeah. uh, Moinuddin Chishti and it, so on. Yes, so this yes. is the big divide within Sunnis between Barelvis and Deobandis. Or, or in Pakistan, uh, Pakpatan, Gan Shakar, there are lots of these Sufi saints who who this stream prays to. Yeah. 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 Uh, 
so i mean this they here you also see a, uh, a focus on bjp's welfare politics so when they're talking to a lot of pasmandas who happen to be economically very backward their thrust is on welfare schemes they they are not talking about the ram mandir and so so on that that politics is completely absent in their outreach to poor muslims they are only talking about welfare schemes and, and the sabka saath sabka vikas slogan is kind of very dominant and in there. lucknow and up in general uh people like vajpayee even rajnath singh they are not unpopular among the muslims particularly the no. shias no not at all not at all in fact while traveling to uh, in lucknow i came across this businessman who was a shia leader and he is kind of leading the campaign for rajnath singh and he's doing this through we'll show uh, you his pictures as we talk yes yeah and he's and he's very different from the religious leadership that the bjp has uh, cultivated among shias uh, so far and it's it's not just lucknow in fact if you see uh, gujarat uh, Modi, when he was chief minister, he cultivated very close ties with Dawoodi Boharas, who were again a sect within the Shia community. And uh, even at the time when a lot of uh, Muslims were disillusioned, it was the Dawoodi Boharas who kind of stood by Modi. Dawoodi Boharas, in fact, are a very uh, outgoing and very enterprising community. And I have a little personal story to tell you. Uh, time I was taken to meet. the sayedna the head of the sect he gave me a little box for a gift and i thought must be a perfume or something so i took it i came home and i opened it and it had a watch what watch was it this watch was it and that's the watch i have worn now for more than 12 years it's an omega i checked how much it cost it wasn't a very expensive watch it was one of the cheaper omega watches and i checked out the price and to be to be completely truthful I made an equivalent donation to one of his charities as well. It is a good watch, and at that point, I didn't have one, so I did need a watch. Uh, even Kalbe Jawad in 2014, when Kalbe Jawad being the Shia, the most prominent Shia cleric in India, he's like the Pope for Shias. I write in the story. Uh, he wrote in 2014 that we are scared of Modi, but we are not scared of Rajnath Singh. He has the acceptability of Vajpayee for us. And remember, uh, Vajpayee. It was during Kalyan Singh's time that. there was a 21 year old ban on muharram processions in lucknow uh, muharram being very uh, sort of uh, very important for shias and it was the kalyan singh government that had lifted this ban uh, so since that time shias uh, have felt that they, at least the shia leadership has felt so that kalyan they had kalyan singh lifted the ban and yet kept the peace yes yet kept the peace and so since then we see that the shia leadership has been close to but some of it leaders. again became an issue of tension uh, during the pandemic during the pandemic and i think most uh, religious leaders shia leaders were okay with the fact that the muharram processions were being uh, S- prohibited suspended, yes. suspended for a few years because of the pandemic but there was a circular for example that the up dgp uh, sort of sent out at that time which said that uh, during the mo- processions you may have cases of sexual assault you may have cases of cow slaughter so we must not have these processions and this enraged the community at large uh, um and that is the problem in this whole uh, idea that the shia community as a whole votes for the bjp that is not entirely true it's just that the shia religious leadership some of them have cultivated close relationships with some leaders in the bjp but the shia community by and large it we cannot conclude that it sort of supports the bjp in that yeah. fashion and there was also that tension over a line that yogi, yogi adityanath used in his campaign which was um, that agar unke paas uh, ali hai to hamare paas bajrang bali hai and ali being sort of very uh, very important for the shias that was seen as an attack on shias um so among shias there is a sense that yogi is no vajpay and yogi is no rajnath singh so there is a there is that tension and as you well write that in your huge. story that shias leadership actually reached out to rajnath singh to see if he could pers- persuade yogi yogi adityanath to withdraw that line yes and uh, but by and large the problem the what shias uh, a lot of shias uh, are feeling is that uh the shia religious leadership the clergy has been obsequious to the bjp uh, they're not really getting a, and the uh, and they feel that in the politics of hate uh 
people do not differentiate between Shias and Sunnis and Shias have to suffer as much as Sunnis do. So they are beginning to ask this question that all right you have aligned yourself with the BJP but what are they doing for the community really? So mm -hmm. those questions and there is a looming crisis of credibility also. The clergy, you, you know the, among Muslims there is a very clear sense of what is the sacred space and what is the or dharm ke these are two separate domains mm -hmm. and they do not like if the the, the clergy siyasati or mazhabi siyasati or mazhabi and they do not like the clergy sort of giving these kind of aligning themselves so openly uh, politically and with the kalbi jawad family for example you see uh, a, a few of his members are his in his uncle the his father they were all dadas of the community uh, which in those days in early days congress leaned on and then yes. samajwadi party yes and and Kalbi Jawad now sort of gives open appeals uh, to his community to vote for the BJP and that is not quite liked by the community. Yeah. So, but the BJP has some outreach in that area. Yes, yes. Now, the other thing that we thought we'll talk about today uh, before we let you go is just the power of the clergy because the idea of the Muslim vote bank and the rule of the fatwa, the idea of the Muslim vote bank actually resides in the rule of or the notion of the rule of the fatwa that some ulema gave a call on the eve of February election and the usual suspect was Shahi Imam of Jama Masjid, right? Now, he was Shahi Imam in Shah Jahan's times. Yeah, and that's why Shahi because that, the uh, Imam of the empire. Yes, Shahi Imam because he was so, he, he was so proclaimed in Shah Jahan's times. He was called Imamul Sultan, Sultan ka Imam, which means Shahi Imam. And he had been regularly issuing fatwas which made headlines and an impression grew and that also enabled the BJP to talk of appeasement politics that Congress party cultivates Shahi Imam or ulema like that who then issue fatwas for Muslims to vote for the Congress party. Now where is, where is the power of the ulema? Who are the ulema? Will they count for much in this coming election Sanya? So, this idea, uh, you know, again, to quote Hilal Ahmed, he says one of the most enduring myths about minority politics and Muslim politics in India is that the ulema, which is the religious leadership of the community, gives a political fatwa and the entire community follows them and votes in accordance with the fatwa. Uh, that has, it's not backed by data, any kind of electoral data that, uh, but it's, it's not even refuted by any kind of data. So we have no data to prove it this way or that. Uh, but what we do know is that the kind of respect and credibility that the ulema enjoyed in the 60s and the 70s, it is far from that now. In fact, um, when I was talking to a Congress leader, a Muslim Congress leader in Lucknow, he said that, of course, Maulana's run whisper campaigns for different political parties. But now that the credibility crisis is so intense that if uh, Maulana gives, um, uh, sort of uh, asks Mus uh, people to vote for uh, a certain candidate, they're suspicious of some under the table deal. That the Maulana so, has made a deal. So, so the Maulana has made a deal. So there is a massive credibility crisis. Uh, of of the clergy itself, so uh, we we don't quite we, we don't quite know. New gen Muslims are educated and modern as much as members of other communities. Exactly. So, the, so 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 they ask questions. Now, if you look at the fatwas, Shahi Imam, uh, our Delhi ka Shahi Imam, he is given fatwas for different parties. Yeah. He was giving fatwas for Congress party earlier. 1989, he gave a fatwa for VP Singh's party, Janata Dal. So much so uh, that VP Singh really cultivated him. And 2004, 2004, he gave a fatwa for the BJP. Uh, yeah. I, if the masses of Muslims had voted for the BJP, I don't know. And Shahi Imam's uh, stature has particularly de uh, declined. If you talk to any sort of Muslim clergy across um, different parts of the country, they say that it is that wo jama masjid ke aspas bhi vote nahi la payenge. Unke bolne ka koi fayda nahi hoga. Actually, just to tell you a little story, he had once thrown me out of uh, out of Jawa Masjid compound. I was I had set up a walk the talk with Mira Nair, the filmmaker, and she said, "Let's go to the Jawa Masjid compound." And we had gone there, and he came down and he looked at me and he said, "Aap jo karna chahe, kar le, lekin inko hum yahan hi karne denge, 
ये बिल्कुल गलत है ये नाचने गाने वालियों को हम यहाँ नहीं आने देंगे आई प्लीड इट विद हिम आई रीजन विद हिम आई ट्राई टू टेल हर वॉट ए रिप्यूटेड फिल्म मेकर शी वॉज बट ही वॉज गुड रिसन टू मी सो वी वॉक आउट वी रिकॉर्डेड आउटसाइड जामा मस्जिद एंड देन वी ऑल्सो सेट डाउन फॉर ए मील ऑफ निहारी एट वन ऑफ द शॉप्स देयर एंड डिट पार्ट ऑफ द इंटरव्यू वाइल हैविंग दैट वंडरफुल मील एज वेल सो ही ही इज इंक्रीजिंगली नाउ द काइंड ऑफ अ entrepreneur in chief of that area i don't i also don't believe that he now commands any vote particularly but is that true of most of the ulema in india now i think so because if you look at some of the crucial moments of muslim uh, politics or muslim protest in the last few years you see the clergy has been entirely absent and i'm talking about starting from 2017 uh, when muslim women were sort of spearheading a legal uh, uh, battle against triple talaq the clergy was nowhere to be found uh, anti ca uh, protests in 2019 again uh, led by women mostly from uh, shaheen bagh in delhi uh, also or from, students or from, or from activists of the left Uh, yes and also students from uh, yeah. jamia and amu the clergy JMU. was missing the clergy was entirely missing again and uh, at the time of the uh, temple consecration in uh, in january we did not hear any voices from the clergy so by and large the clergy seems to have gone silent in fact the only member of the muslim clergy the only ulema member of the ulema we heard about during the temple consecration was was the one who attended the consecration that is molana or molvi umair ilyasi and we have a story about that sania please tell us the story so umair ilyasi obviously molana umair ilyasi he hit the headlines for going to the ram temple um, and then he had a fatwa issued against him for doing so uh, but what we don't know he and he is the head of the all india imam organization uh, its office is right in the heart of delhi in copernicus mark what we didn't know is that his father jamil ilyasi was very very close to indira gandhi in fact there's a there's a legend which is corroborated in uh, in uh, rashid kidwai senior journalist rashid kidwai's book as well that at the time of the 1980 general election indira gandhi was very extremely nervous uh, about whether she's going to win or not and at that time she was meeting all kinds of holy men and one of those holy men who she met was jamil ilyasi and um, molana she, molana J- jamil ilyasi and he said that i sh- uh, you will have to let me tie something in the some kind of charm in some the some kind of an uh, an amulet or maybe a holy thread or something somewhere on the ceiling on of on the her ceiling bedroom. of her bedroom which uh, she did and then she won with 353 seats landslide victory uh, but there was a caveat uh, molana ilyasi had told indira gandhi but as soon as you win you have to call me back Indira Gandhi forgot to do that um and uh later Sanjay Gandhi died she was absolutely not long after not long after and she was absolutely depressed distraught the molana was called back uh molana equally distraught who said why did you not call me back i told you to call me back after you win the election now you have to offer namaz to correct what you have what you did not do uh and she uh, indira gandhi was so shaken that she obliged so she this is in uh, rashid kidwai's book this is in rashid kidwai's book and this jamil ilyasi uh, molana jamil ilyasi was uh, molana umair ilyasi's father who is very close to now the and, bjp and, 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 and the rss jamil ilyasi then removed that that child, remo- that, that was rich well now we don't want to promote any superstition <laughs> anywhere this is not the movies like this is not a bollywood movie so just to get the perspective right mrs gandhi may have made up with the molana after her son's unfortunate death but it's also true that whatever peace she made with the molana and whatever other charm he might have offered her that did not protect her from getting assassinated just 4 years later so once again we don't promote any superstition whatsoever it is just a very fascinating political story isn't it it just for me what this uh, anecdote does is it tells you that uh, the relationship between the muslim clergy and mainstream politicians is not straightforward we cannot understand it through a political fatwa here or there it's far more complicated and right now you see is rapid decline in the power of the clergy 
we can we can definitely say that as we talked about their absolute absence in some pivotal moments of muslim politics in the last few years so these are wonderful insights sanya thank you very much and uh, as we go along because there'll be so much politics over the next few months i think you can count on me for dragging you once again and talking about some of these issues because you are now looking at some of the most in depth issues that drive today's politics that is the ideological impulse of the bjp and rss on the one side and second the mind of our largest minority on the other